Good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to welcome you to St. John College's One Slide Talks tonight. And um, we're welcoming all of you on behalf of the St. John College's Academic Committee. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today in person, as well as we have some guests online through Zoom who will also be joining us. Um, so today we actually have over 20 uh, SJC current residents, as well as alumni, who are SJC scholarship affiliated winners. Uh, who will be sharing their unique um, presentations about their research topics and it ranges from history, science, to education. So we have diverse topics and diverse research topics and yeah, it really reflects the um, diversity of our college and what everyone is um, working on and sharing. So we're really excited to hear their presentations. Um, so after each presentation, uh, we will also have time for Q&A. So as you guys are listening to everyone's presentation, um, feel free to think of some questions or even just share some feedback, like if something resonated with you, um, feel free to share that with the speaker. Um, so my name is Catherine and I'm a current resident and Masters of Journalism student at UBC. And um, this is Shinka and she is a PhD student in education at UBC. Um, and today we'll be here to host and um, introduce each of the speakers to, tonight. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on the traditional um, ancestral and unceded territory of the Muslim people. And now we'd like to invite um, the St. John College Principal, Professor Dr. Henry Yu, to share a few words with us. Thanks, uh, thanks to the academic committee for organizing all this. I just want to say a couple of things because this is the first time we've been able to do this since COVID. Um, and we will also, uh, for those who really enjoy this talk and those who are sharing and, and think that we cut you off too soon, that we will also restart the um, uh, resident fellows uh, speaker series. And so then you can get to go 15, 20 minutes about your work um, because we're going to be really stringent cutting you off. So please don't take it personally when Shinka starts to make, you know, motions and and then eventually we turn on the lights. Yeah. Um, and then someone's going to tackle you out of the way. But um, all joking aside, your ability to give an elevator pitch, so to speak, a short summation of your work is crucial for your career development. And that means getting a job. So if you're in an academic field, I've been to enough job talks that there's one thing that kills a candidate and they never know it. They went past the time they were given. So, and you give a 20 minute talk and they, and they think, I got it. I'm so interesting, I'm gonna check back in 25 minutes. You don't know it, but the first thing that the committee that is examining you or sort of talking about you later is like, the guy didn't listen, he didn't stay within 20. And it, it literally, I've never seen someone who went over it giving an academic talk, get hired. That's how, because it's just one moment, it's your job talk, right? Every, all eyes are on you, don't go over the time. No one will ever say, he didn't spend, he didn't take his whole 20 minutes. Does that make sense? So one of the ways to learn that kind of discipline is in a setting like this, where we're not gonna fire you if you go over. But don't go over, <laughs> um, we will turn off. I think one of the things also is this is about running into someone at a conference or running into someone at or, or even as your aunt saying, so what do you do again? You know, why are you in graduate school? And if you bore the crap out of your aunt, that again means that you're you're not able to explain what's interesting about your work in a short amount of time. So so thanks everyone for coming as audience, but also thank all the speakers for you know taking the guts to come up here. Um, and sharing your work, um, it'll be good for you. For all those who are in here who are share, sharing your work, but also listening, you know, give some constructive, gentle, useful feedback. Like um, if someone unconsciously says um a lot or something, don't go, you know, you gotta stop saying um. It'd be really sound stupid. You say, oh, well, you know, it was great. We, and you sort of gently said, uh, you tend sometimes when you're nervous and you pause to say, um, you know, it's something that, uh, that maybe, you know, you practice more and, and try to, to get out. Does that make sense? Like, we're, we're all here to help each other. So, so please do do the favor of giving some feedback. It doesn't have to be tonight um, at some other time, you know, gently. Um, another 
last thing is, uh, again, uh, practice, practice, take every opportunity to share your work um, to, to different types of people, to different audiences. So uh, again, think about signing up for the, the fellow speaker series. We weren't able to do it through the pandemic, but as we start that up again, it's another way. Uh, lastly, why this is great is you get to know each other now through your work too. And I know at dinner you, you talk to each other through social events, but uh, sometimes we don't share our work because you're you're doing it in your lab or you're doing it in, uh, and you don't, don't want to come here and, and, and infect the dinner table with your with your ideas from your, uh, your classes. But this is another way to get to know each other better. So, anyways, thank you so much, and I encourage you uh, to to kind of enjoy this too. for you tonight in terms of logistics and organization. So I will be the Iron Face timekeeper for tonight, so please don't hate me for that. So how this works is I will have you, everyone will have three minutes in total to present their talk and followed by two minutes Q&A. So when you have one minute left, I will hold up this, and when the time is up, I will hold up this. If you are not finished yet, you probably will have 30 seconds to do like summarize and finish, and, and uh, if you go beyond the time, I probably I will sump the gong over there. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit too long, so we really appreciate everyone. Uh, be mindful of time because we have lots of wonderful presentations today, and there's also some refre uh, refreshments over there. Please feel free to treat yourself with some sweet and coffee, and also uh, you probably will notice um, at some tables there will be. Uh, this lo little notepad created by our lovely colleague um, Joanna. Uh, you can use this uh, little note to note down some things for yourself, as well as um, as a tool to offer some feedback for your peers. So I think without further ado, we will get started. Thank you so much, Nika, for sharing that. And so now we're really excited to welcome up our first speaker of tonight. And his name is Siwei, and he will be talking about coarse grain theories for fluids. Very excited. Okay, so let's give him a round of applause and welcome him up. Hey, good night, everyone. Uh, my name is Siwei Luo from the chemistry department, and um, today I'm going to talk about my thesis work, which is coarse grain theories for fluids. So I want to start with uh, explaining what is coarse graining or coarse grain theories. So as you can see the figure on the uh, top left, uh, we have different theories for different time scales and different length scales. Uh, for very small, like tiny uh, particles like ele electrons, we have quantum dynamics, uh, which is basically describe the system using Schrodinger equations. And to go move up, we can use Newton's equation to describe the motion of atomistic systems, like motion of proteins uh, in water. And if you keep moving up, we are, heat, we are heating basically the regime of coarse graining. Uh, that basically means uh, we actually are trying to start at a time scale of nanometers, uh, uh, time scales of nanoseconds, and then scales of nanometers. And we keep going up, we will have continuum methods, which is like the real stocks equations you may have heard of. So the challenge here is basically in between the Navier stocks and quantum theories, we don't have a very rigorous framework of describing the uh, uh, dynamics of systems at nano scales, and that's basically uh, the reason why I studied this project in my PhD studies. So next. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we want to explore new physics at uh, nano scales. And can you uh, move next, please? Okay, and how to do that is basically through a rigorous framework called projection theories in physics. And uh, can we go next, please? Yeah. So uh, it's a complicated theory, so I want to explain from very simple daily life examples, which is shadows. So as you can see, right, when you work under the sun, you you basically see shadows, and that's basically a way of uh, seeing projections. Right, the light will project your body on a two-dimensional surface. And if you think that in physics, in a more abstract sense, um, can you go next, please? We can actually project uh, the motion of particles at atomistic level to some 
collective variables in another space, in a reduced uh, dimension space. And you can study the motion of particles in that coarse grained space. And uh, there is a formal theory called Maurice Vons, if that, um, if you're very interested in that, you can Google it. But after some simple math, can you do next? Uh, you will see the simple <laughs> equations on the uh, bottom left. Okay? So I will not dive into the details of the equations, but I will just talk about the major results absent. Um, so I studied the uh, maybe one third of the equations I uh, shown here, and we basically discover, uh, understand now the, the interactions between those coarse grain variables, and also we um, know the conservative part of the equation, which means we understand what will happen to the uh, uh, to the uh, motion of those uh, collective variables at the equilibrium, and also uh, we understand how uh, actually some very subtle uh, interesting physics showing up on the uh, nanoscale. Uh, and finally, can we go next? I want to thank the basic St. John's College and uh, uh, my funding re resources uh, for supporting my future studies. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Siwei, for sharing your presentation. Um, and now we have two minutes for um, the audience to share, ask any questions to our presenter here. So does anyone have any questions? Yes, Parham. So on the graph that you have, you have time and length. What does the length sound like? The length of what? Uh, length of your uh, on physical scale, basically like for, for, for nano, for example, for quantum theories, we're looking at scales that are very small, like uh, oh, photometers. Okay. Okay, so also, continuum is like basically like micrometers or meters. Yeah. So it's not a, like a length, actually, like it's, it's just a figure of speech. It's not like really, um, like by length you mean quantum and. Uh, it's not some a quantitative thing, it's usually like a. Yeah, I think the point you really hear represents the computational power you can use because quantum theories are usually very good for very small systems. Right. In principle, you can treat a large system, but that will take maybe ages. Oh, yes. So that's the issue. Any more questions? Just what do you, would there be in your mind a, a kind of um, use for this that goes beyond uh, just finding out what coarse graining looks like and things? Or? Yes, in the future we want to implement these equations and make it to computer code so we can maybe simulate, uh, you know, like real systems such as like biological systems or nanomaterials or something mm -hmm. like that. But that's our long term. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for the audience for your questions. Okay, so our next speaker, we're actually going to be changing uh, disciplines. We're going to be going to history from science. And so our next speaker is Lewis. So let's welcome Lewis up. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Lewis. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a student of ancient history at UBC. Um, and over the summer, I was excavating at a site called Corvette Midras, which I've bolded on the map here. This is of the ancient Levantine coastline. Um, this is an ancient archaeological site that has been inhabited for nearly a thousand years. So its first occupation was in the late 4th century BCE, about 2,500 years ago, and then it was almost continuously used up until the year 749 CE, when an earthquake destroyed this site and destroyed um, a number of sites across the Levantine coast. Um, there are lots of different communities over time that had used this space and have left this space. The two that really matter for our purposes, for the purposes of our excavation, are the Jewish and Roman periods. So the Jewish period lasts from the late second century BCE for about a, for about a 200 year period and gives rise to a quite prosperous and well-off socioeconomic community. After a failed revolt against Rome, um, the Jewish community, many Jews were killed, others were likely forcibly removed by Roman authorities, and this left the site abandoned for about half a century. At around 200 CE, so about 50 years later, the Romans actually moved into the site themselves. They built on top of everything, they built their own structures, um, and then they continuously occupied the site through the Roman, the Byzantine, Byzantine just means late Roman for our purposes, and the early Islamic periods up until 749 when that earthquake destroyed everything. So that's a basic overview of the site. Um, what we were excavating this season was this building. Um, we had already worked on it a little bit over previous seasons. I was not at UBC, so I didn't participate in that. But previous excavations had shown that we already knew that this was a Roman building. 
We knew that first because it was uh, made of Roman ashlar, which is a typical type of Roman stone we find across the, across the Roman world in building construction. But most importantly, we have pottery. Now, pottery is really important at any archaeological um, excavation because it's really easy to date. So we can tell from the pottery finds that we have that this site was used in the Roman and late Roman periods. What we didn't know was what the building was. How did it function? And that's where the season comes in. And that's where, I'm going to say this, sorry to move over a little bit, but this middle square here um, is the square that I excavated this season. This was something new. We had not done any work on this before. And this is really the key, because we found a staircase here. You can see a set of parallel stones leading down to an open platform, um, and then that led into one of these inner chambers. That gives us a pretty good indication of what we think we have as a Roman temple, um, because we have a staircase leading up into an open courtyard, which is a common design in the Roman world. I mean, you can actually see some of these stones are slightly offset. These would have originally formed a circle that went all the way around the courtyard. And then we have a set of stairs leading down. Sometimes in Roman temples, there's just a platform leading forward. But in this case, there's a set actually leading down into what are called cali. And that's what we think these three, these three structures on the end were. These are inner spaces where certain rituals would have taken place and certain um, enclosed, only certain admitted peoples would have been allowed into this area. But there are still some questions we'd like to answer. The first is related to, you can barely see it on this slide, but this tiny little circle over there, that is the hole for a cistern. Um, we think, now it's common for Roman temples to have cisterns, but that, that one is about eight meters deep, so that one is particularly, is much larger than we'd expect. And then the big question is whether this structure um, was built on top of a previous Jewish structure, or whether this was just built by the Romans themselves, and we'll need more excavation for that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Louis. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for Louis about his presentation? All right, Patrick. Okay, and Louis, for um, people on Zoom, can you also repeat? So Patrick wanted to know more about Roman ashlar and what it's made out of. Um, it, Roman ashlar is more about the cut actually itself. It's a specific, you can tell from the, the, the shape of the stone. So it's a rectangle and like Herodian boss is another example. We have that in Judea where the stone sticks out a little bit. Herodian, Herodian ashlar is just straight. So it's straight through, there's nothing on the stone and it's always very well designed. You can, the joke in Israel is if it's well designed, it's a Roman site. If it's poorly designed, it's a Byzantine site. Um, the Roman sites are very well designed, um, they're very clean, um, and so there's very little space between the stones. The stones are put in, there's like mortar that's put, or what is called plaster, that's put in between the stones to keep them in place. Um, and it's very instantly recognizable. If you were to talk to someone who does more material culture, they have more details, but that's the extent of it that we as historians work with. Ashish? That's a very good stop. Oh, I'm supposed to question. Okay. Okay, so my question is, uh, did you damage anything while excavating this site? So archaeology is destruction. Um, in order to do, this is part of the problem with archaeology, is once you excavate something, you can never excavate it again. Um, so yes, we found, we would find, for instance, before this staircase, there was a whole collapsed layer of a vault, and we found these large stones, and what you do is we find the stones, we document them, take pictures of them, make sure we knew where they were, and then have um, some folks come in with really big hammers, we'd all be evacuated, and they would smash it up and destroy it. Oh because there's no other way to get to the bottom and figure out what's beneath it. So archaeology is destruction. There's always destruction. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And so our next speaker will also be sharing with us through Zoom, and uh, it will be Joe Yang. So. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? I think we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Joe Yang, and I've been living in St. John's College from 2015 to 2021, which is uh, six years, and I have just finished my uh, PhD uh, in uh, 2021 as well. So I can uh, easily remember all those tables, all the uh, scenarios of having dinner together. We have uh, very nice dishes and those kind of like ice water jars in order to refill all those waters, right? So speaking of those kind of uh, ice water jars, my question is, why do you think those ice cubes are floating above the water? So if you know a little bit about chemistry, you know that in, ice, uh, in, in those kind of ice cubes, the water molecules are actually aligned in a highly ordered orientation, and they are confined by the hydrogen bonding in between. But for liquid water, their orientations are more random, uh, more acting more random. 
Therefore, the average distance is smaller, and that's why the liquid water is more dense than the solid water. So that's why the ice is floating on top of water. And that's why fishes can survive a winter in a Canadian lake, because only the top part is frozen to ice. The bottom part is still water. Now you can see how the chemical structures are actually affecting what the nature looks like. That is the importance of chemical structures. And speaking of chemistry, maybe a lot of people are thinking of explosions, right? So now it's, uh, I also talk about a very famous explosive called TNT. TNT's chemical structure looks like this. You can see that there are a lot of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, and nitrogen atoms. And actually, when the explosion happens, the molecule will decomposite into carbon dioxide, gases, water, and nitrogen. So there are a lot of gases. And the total volume will increase all in a sudden. So that's why when we're looking at it, it's like an explosion. So here, the nitrogen is being essential because eventually all the nitrogen elements are converted into gases and stable nitrogen. So that is essential to increase the volume. And according to the so-called KJ formula, having a high density and having a wonderful chemical composition will also matter for explosive to be accident. Therefore, we can try to design this kind of new explosive molecules according to these rules. So the other two projects in my PhD studies are also related to chemical structures and molecule designs. So in those kind of studies, we use computer programs to optimize the geometric structure first and then try to investigate the characteristics of those new molecules and maybe also try to think of some potential applications. So I believe those theoretical research will play an important part in the future chemistry research. Thank you. So now we have some time for questions. Does anyone have questions for Joe? Oh. Oh. Okay, well, I, I have a quick question for um, mm -hmm. so my question is like what inspired you to um, research and pursue this topic and like was it inspired by kind of seeing how ice cubes float on water or like yeah what um, inspired you to um, come up with this research topic and that um, okay. Uh, I guess it's more like a family issue because my mom is working in those chemical uh, industry uh, field and my grandmother was a high school uh, bi uh, biology teacher. So uh, under their affection, I actually when I first learned chemistry when I was uh, around the ninth grade, it actually uh, astonishes me when I actually found that everything around us are all um, composed from um, all made up from those very basic chemistry elements. So that, that has actually like changed my mind to like, like, how do I see the world? And then I started to be interested in those chemical structures. <laughs> and at that time I often asked myself, okay, uh, what about that thing's element? What elements are there in like glasses or plastic or those kind of things? So maybe from then I'm starting to have an interest in those kind of chemical structures and how they can affect our world. Uh, sorry, I cannot hear you. Okay, uh, so <laughs> we have our next speaker, uh, Justin. Thank you. So, is Justin here? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so pass the stage to Justin. And he'll be talking about 20th... Uh... Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm Justin from the history department. I graduated two years ago. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my, my uh, MA thesis, which I brought here. Um, so, so basically my topic focused on Hong Kong, which was a British colony um, for one and a half century in, in China. And then um, my argument from my thesis is that like, uh, Hong Kong was a proud colony, so um, the, co the governor, uh, he was the head of the colony, so literally he had a lot, a huge power. 
um, um, even though he was technically the, the or in London was his boss, right? Um, so my, my argument in this is that um, even though like, technically he was under some kind of you know, constitutional framework and all these kind of check and balances, but um, but but um, but actually um, I want to show that there are the there are other some kinds of um, check and check from other um, from other ways like the bureaucratic bureaucratic practices at an everyday level. So first I will use so the data I used the typhoon in 1906 um, to to show that. Um, so I use some sources like the correspondences between uh, London, the colonial office, and the governor, and then some government records and some newspapers in Chinese and English, and also some other um, uh, memorials from in China and some um, private uh, letters in the charities. Um, so first, I would like to talk about colonial office. So um, um, the colonial office was the institution who, who gave the instruction and also made appointment um, to, to manage to supervise the, the governor. Um, yeah, but actually in reality, um, they didn't really supervise them. So, so, uh, so in, in, in reality, they just let the governor do, do whatever he wanted. Um, but from these uh, documents I read, I read um, there's some kinds of practices that um, keep him in check. So, for example, some communications like uh, after the typhoon. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a typhoon, so uh, uh, he need to he need to uh, file a lot of report, very detailed report to, to the colonel office. But actually, the the office wouldn't have any time to read it and even give um, timely instruction because it would take a month to get to London. Um, so that's that's the way to keep in track. In track, but on the other hand, um, from the governor's perspective. Um, he he needed to write that detailed report to show the office that he did a good job. He didn't mean mismanaged the colony and he didn't abuse the power. So that's the way I have to argue. Um, let's keep the logical. Um, and I will quickly go to the the elite and the European and Chinese elite. So this is a, some some a group of um, collaborators to the governor. Um, so in two ways. The first is that um, the European elite they put the Position themselves as a political partner, so they they, they, they are willing to give comments and criticize government in terms of local policies and all this kind of stuff. And then, but then for Chinese elites, um, they didn't do that. They they rather uh, stick with their own Chinese circle. They do other uh, they rather comment on other Chinese nations in the area. Um, so in this in this sense, they take a more of as an administrative administrative role to help the governor. In the colony, um, so this is how they put themselves in these positions. But on the other hand, the government also recognized this role by by putting them um, into different institutions, committees, um, to act, to um, enhance their role and to help them. So um, yeah, I guess the time to have stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, does anyone have any questions for Justin? Neil. Do you want to come up and actually say it to the microphone so that um, our guests on Zoom can, can hear your question? Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. So my question is, um, where, what's your source for all the reports and how do you make sure that they're objective and uh, correct, like true? Thanks. So for the sources, I mostly there from, um, as I said, the, the, uh, the correspondence between London and Hong Kong, I can find it in Hong Kong. I hope there are some um, government records that are online, and also the newspapers actually. So most of them are online, um, and so it's very, very uh, convenient sources. And then for the for details, actually, I, I for example, that report, um, it's not important. It doesn't matter a lot, like whether they're true or not. But, but the way that the governor addresses, like, um, you know, like it take it took a month to to get to London, so it doesn't matter whatever he wrote, right? He wrote to London and when he got back the, the, the replies from them, it doesn't matter um, what is that, because a month later all the beliefs and for the they will be, will be uh, implemented. So, um, so what's important is not, it's not that all these technical details or all, all these figures are true or not, but the way to do it and what what he what he reported and what he did not report. I think we have another question, yeah, from 
yes, that's a question. Could you read that question? Yes, yeah, sure. So the, the question is about uh, whether other colonies, or other British colonies have similar structure. I think um, the closest example would be the Singapore district mm -hmm. settlements, because uh, they also share the same um, crown colony structure, which is the governor was the head, and he had huge power, not unlike um, the other, some other colonies, for example, like in those of, like in uh, North America, which, which uh, the governor would be checked by a kind of kind of democratic uh, assembly. Alright, thank you, Justin. Okay. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, and up next, our speaker is a member of our very own St. John's Academic Committee, um, Shinka, so she'll be coming up. Yeah. Alright. So. so, hi everyone, my name is Shinka. I'm currently a PhD student uh, in the program of Human Development, Learning and Culture at Faculty of Education. So human development as a very broad field uh, seeks to understand how people learn and develop in various learning contexts and across different life stages. So for me, my research primarily uh, focuses on the stage of emerging adulthood, uh, which typically lasts from the year of 18 to about 25. So my goal for my research is trying to understand how young adults develop that sense of identity and find their voice during this critical time in their life and eventually develop a sense of self-authorship. So self-authorship as a theory uh, was developed by Robert Kagan, um, his theory of evolving self and further developed by Baxter Magoda. And it presents an integrative perspective young, uh, on young adult development that uh, involves the epistemological, interpersonal, and interpersonal dimensions. So in terms of the journey towards self-authorship, it describes a process of that shift um, from, uh, uh, from just uncritically accepting identities, beliefs, and values from others, from those authorities in our life, and towards um, a process of defining those values and identities and social relationships for ourselves. So people move across those three major stages to develop a sense of self authorship So in terms of my research, um, my research aims to understand how young adults, for example college students and young professionals like service teachers develop a sense of self authorship in various learning contexts. And as a, as a qualitative researcher, um, I primarily use narrative inquiry in my research which is a study of stories, and I also sometimes use art-based approaches to explore how people make meaning of their life experiences and how do they express that sense of self-authorship. So my master's research uh, was a narrative inquiry of Chinese students' uh, self-authoring journeys, in which I identify these four um, narrative patterns that I found in Chinese, story, uh, Chinese students' stories in terms of how they try to author their own voice uh, through passion, resistance, confidence, and there are some interesting outlier stories too. And uh, my PhD research, um, I'm in the process of developing my proposal for that, so that will focus on pre-service teachers' identity and self-authorship and to expand um, a little bit on what I did. So I want to include three different groups of teachers, one, uh, two from uh, UBC, one is the, a middle year teacher cohort, one is indigenous teacher, teachers, and one is a Chinese teacher cohort. And by doing that, I hope to bring teachers' voices from different cultural groups and contributing to a more expansive and culturally responsive framework of teacher self-authorship. So, yeah, so that's my research. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shinka. Oh, we have a question there? Yeah, uh, why don't you come on up and, yeah. So that people um, on Zoom can hear your question. Can you explain what is out, not outlier narrative? Yeah. Uh, very interesting because we, you know, in terms of these concepts like self-authorship, people will assume that people will develop that sense of, you know, um, like start to critically examine those internalized beliefs that uh, they appropriate from their family, from their community, uh, from external authorities, and eventually, um, like, um, 
reach a stage where they define values for themselves. But like I found outliers uh, in my research that, you know, it's kind of offered a counter narrative of a growth oriented trajectory. Like people are seeking those important life experiences to transform themselves. But I found some students, you know, they will just speak very honest to me. I'm afraid I don't have anything interesting for you. So as a researcher who is interested in their story about you know personal growth, transformation, but they are just, I don't think college is that time where I think I experienced that tremendous uh, significant growth uh, in my life. So um, that basically summarizes the outliers, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, okay. So oh, I have a few questions. Um, so I see Juno's hand, and yeah, you first. This is wonderful. I'll try to make this quick because I know we're like already past two minutes. Um, I was curious about like if there have been like more like outliers or changes uh, in this type of research since because obviously like peers have it also a huge amount of influence right. on development. But now since kids are so you know online <laughs> and exposed to many many more peers um, and many more ideas, has that kind of altered the trajectory of this type of research as that mm -hmm. paradigm shift has continued? Um, really really great. Um, actually, there's an emerging a scholarship that really challenges these type of models that typically developed from a really individualistic and uses participant samples that are primarily weird populations that is like predominantly white middle class and there's emergent research on for example queer students on students of color students of more marginalized experience and they started to really challenge you know not everyone um, you know just have to to be really very individualistic just to achieve their own needs for themselves, but really include a social justice lens in terms of really deconstruct those external authority discourse and that kind of infiltrate that power and structure um, of the broader society. So really start to challenge those frameworks um, that uh, this theory was developed upon. So we see some hopes along those lines of scholarship. I think my time is up. Thank you. Very much. If you um, still have questions, you can uh, find her after the presentation and ask her directly as well. All right. So next we have Ali, who will be uh, sharing his presentation through a pre-recorded video. Um, so Devin yeah, will just bring that. This step of who is a as both an acre to your many. Well, it gives them a different flavor, uh, so just very So they can't hear at home. Yeah. Uh, Does this work? Yeah. Does this work, maybe? Can they hear now? Maybe they can write in the chat. They can hear? Mm -hmm. I unmuted mine. But I'm not sure if they can hear uh, Ali, because you probably need to share the audio from your side. Yeah, if I play, then it will hear it, no? She said no. Can you share audio? I think it should. No, because my audio is connected to the speaker. That's why I can't do that. 
Um, so the audio is through Marco. That's what we were doing. Yeah. Okay, so it's not working now. Okay, maybe start it from the beginning. Hello everyone, my name is Ali Purzahidi. I'm a PhD student in the Mechanical Engineering Department at UBC. First of all, I want to thank St. John's College for providing a nice and warm environment for everyone to learn and share their knowledge. So my research is on bubble propagation inside viscoplastic fluids. So viscoplastic fluids are the type of fluids that have both solid and fluid behavior, such as hair gel. And it depends on the amount of shear that you apply on these fluids. So if the shear exceeds a certain amount, they will flow. Below that, they will act like a solid. Uh, these type of fluids appear in a variety of industrial settings, such as pulp and paper, food, cosmetics, and oil and gas. Uh, bubbles are entrapped in cosmetic products, such as deodorant gels, uh, which are often sold by volume. So essentially, you're paying for the volume inside of a deodorant gel. And uh, this is due to the solid characteristics of this uh, fluid. Uh, in the food industry is another example. Entrapment of air bubbles inside the project products will give them a different flavor, uh, such as aerated chocolate. And finally, one of the main motivations behind the study comes from tailings ponds, uh, which are large sailing ponds that store the byproducts of mining. Uh, so pond slurry is made up of uh, clay, seal, water, sand, residual bitumen, and naphtha, uh, which uh, make a viscoplastic fluid. And uh, uh, the problem here is that the bacteria and the microorganisms within this pond uh, uh, degrade the fluid and produce greenhouse gas emissions. And it is estimated that uh, all tailing ponds together produce 8% of Canada's methane emissions, uh, which is equivalent to 3 million tons of CO2 per year. And this is a substantial amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, in all of these um, examples, it is crucial to know the volume of bubbles that could remain entrapped, as well as the velocity and shape of bubbles that could rise. And on the right hand side, uh, you can see an image of an experimental setup uh, to show how bubble propagation behavior changes depending on the surrounding environment. Uh, so my studies will help to quantify the limit for which bubbles rise or remain entrapped inside a viscoplastic fluid. Also help to understand the effect of shape, buoyancy and surface tension on its propagation behavior. Thank you very much for your attention. His presentation, feel free to note that down. And um, if you see him in the dining hall or if you see him around, um, ask him your question then. Okay, uh, so we our next speaker is Fiona. And yeah, so she will be coming up to share a presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Fiona Kalane. I do my PhD in English. Um, so I'll start with a burning question from my research. Why does poetry matter in our conceptions of nature? More specifically, my dissertation asks, how is South Asian diasporic lyric poetry significant for our understandings of contested geographies, human and other than human relationships, and narratives of ecological change in the 20th and 21st centuries? So let's comparatively think with a painting and a poem. Here for you, is this contemporary painting representing a realist landscape or is it telling a different story?
titled as a self-portrait, it is strangely modeled after the landscape paintings of the old masters of early modern Europe. Despite the towering Himalayan mountains, abundant greenery, and the glacial lake in the center, did you notice some odd elements? With the complex architectural sites in the back, there is also a hut in the bottom left. Embedded in this sublime landscape is also a self-portrait of the artist's figure. What do these juxtapositions do for our expectations of a landscape painting? Do we always express and understand the empirical world through rubrics of objectivity versus subjectivity? Or does art, here painting, and in my work poetry, have something more to offer? A complex lens to view the world and its representations. With these questions in mind, let's turn to the lyric poem, Postcard from Kashmir by Aga Shahid Ali. It begins with, quote, Kashmir shrinks into my mailbox, my home a neat four by six inches. I always loved neatness. Now I hold the half inch Himalayas in my hand, end quote. The Grand Himalayas are scaled down to a miniature form as half inch Himalayas on the compact postcard. The poem continues, quote, this is home and this is the closest I'll ever be to home. When I return, the colors won't be so brilliant the Jalem's waters, so clean, so ultramarine. My love, so overexposed, end quote. Through a series of negations, the speaker reads his love object, here the Himalayas, within the inability of a photograph on the postcard to capture the experience of this rapidly changing landscape. As a literary scholar, I encounter definitions of lyric poetry as highlighting the personal, the, confe the confessional, introspective and expressive through the subjective eye of language. But these definitions are not always enough for explaining the critical potential that we can find in the lyric form. While nature writing and representation often emphasize human conquest of pristine, unpeopled, frozen landscapes, here the poet and the painter both represent shifts in scale and play with our normative understandings of the relationships between the self and the world, internal and the external, experience and history that my work explores. Seeds of this work were planted and generously supported in my first year by St. John's College. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Um, anyone have any questions for Fiona's presentation? All right, Louis. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, what do you think the hut, how do you think the hut functions in this painting as opposed to like a more permanent structure or building? Yeah, thank you so much. I thought that it kind of juxtaposes, you know, these binary conceptions of the primitive and the mm. sort of, you know, civilizational progress narratives that we might have. Mm. And the poet is really kind of questioning those binaries and the ways in which we kind of understand modernity. Mm. And I think that's how also the poet that I work on um, engages with you know these very changing landscapes, yeah, yeah and his understanding of time and history and his representation. Great, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Stefan. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I don't know. So um, I don't know whether my question makes sense, but um, for the poetry that you're working with, does the question of language, uh, the the language that a particular poem is. Does that shape the kind of questions that you ask um, to some degree? Yeah, so Stefan asks if the language in which the poem is written, does that affect the representation and probably our, our, our interpretation as well? So I think that's a really great question because some of the poets that I work with work with multiple languages, not mm -hmm. just English. So they're trained in, you know, Hindi, Gujarati, Urdu, and other regional and national South Asian languages. So their understanding of the public and the performative is actually very different from the way we might conceptualize in Anglo-American literary history. So I think um, when I'm talking about the relationship of this poet to displacement or in, in contested geographies, they do bring in the South Asian understandings of the ghazal or the understanding of the self as more than the self. And that's why my title is, you know, parasubjective landscape, so more than the subjective landscape. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you again for those great questions. Uh, we'll be having intermission break soon, but.
but right before that, we have one final speaker before our intermission where we get to mingle and maybe chat with some of the speakers here today, and that is Parham. And Parham will be speaking about, uh, yes. I have a topic. So I think it will be a surprise. So it will be a surprise for all of us. Uh, all surprising. Yeah. Including for the wild part. Uh, so my name is Aaron. I'm doing a PhD in mathematics. And you probably have heard of Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem. So it says that the hypotenuse um, sees. Oh. Yeah. Um, the hypotenuse of, if you have a right angle triangle, then the hypotenuse, the length of the hypotenuse squared is equal to the sum of the squares of the, uh, the other sides. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Does that? I don't know why I'm hearing it with it here. So now think of this as an algebraic um, equation. Forget about geometry. Think of what are the numbers that satisfy this algebraic equation. So 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared. Uh, 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to 13 squared. These are called Pythagorean triplets. And it's, there are infinitely many of them. So the next one I think is 7 squared plus 24 squared is equal to 25 squared. Now this person, uh, Pharma, um, that's the selfie, he uh, conjectured, he actually said, I have a proof of this theorem, which is called Fermat's last theorem, that for uh, powers above 2, so say 3, 4, 5, this equation does not have any solution. So there are no triplets A, B, C that satisfy, say, A cubed plus B cubed is equal to C cubed, or A to power 4 plus B to power 4 is equal to C to power 4. No integers. You cannot find any. So that was open, so this is almost 400 years ago. And in 1994, finally, this was known as uh, in uh, Guinness World of, uh, uh, or record, board records, um, known as the hardest math problems. Uh, and in 1994, uh, it was proven by Andrew Wiles, uh, a mathematician, in Oxford, and he, you know, do you remember when I said forget about geometry, I was kind of tricking you because he remembered geometry. So when he, uh, he remembered that, okay, for a squared plus b equals, equals c squared, we use geometry to prove it. So you can use geometry to prove this. And he used these things called elliptic curves. These are geometrical algebraic things. And so what I work in is, uh, in elliptic curves. I do this thing called Iwasawa theory and I use these algebraic geometric objects to prove a lot of cool um, uh, equations like this. But do they have solution? How many solutions do they have? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the question was, am I applying uh, whatever I'm doing 
uh, into this equation or so this equation is totally solved <laughs> so there are no solution I mean if I did my PhD finding any solution to this I it would be a waste of time but uh, but um, yeah the equations kind of look like this they're like there's a we tweak this a little bit you know they're not as beautiful as this but almost as beautiful but I, I'm, I'm not I didn't write it down because then you'll say oh it's so nice uh, uh, did you I don't know if I'm over 20 minutes, two minutes. <laughs> yeah yeah 20 minutes would be more like uh, thank you So we have had 10 great speakers share really interesting um, presentations about their research. And now we have a five minute intermission break. Uh, so feel free to get some refreshments or you know, mingle and chat with some of the speakers and with your fellow residents. So was one of so was the COVID project sort of because of COVID and just got stuck on you and you were actually working on jellyfish already or is it? Uh, yeah, I'm glad I got to do that actually. Uh, the other projects that I did mentioned were kind of hard to come back. Okay. And it got funded through the okay. okay. Is there part of a, a whole lab that was doing kind of COVID? No, research, no? we were just a protein biology kind of lab, lot of simulation work. So, I mean, a long time ago when I was in grad school, um, that was what the kind of energy states of long molecules was like biophysics. There was actually modeling with like metals and stuff like, or you know, like they were physically kind of trying to model it because um, rather, I think computational power wasn't uh, as strong. Yeah, it would have taken a lot longer to, but it's kind of interesting, like, you, you can now simulate almost any complex molecule in terms of, or how hard is it to actually get, um, yeah, you get it to be that, a, yeah. one graph there with a rather small protein, yeah. uh, I was running like 4,000 CPUs for two okay, So it is still, uh, still not sort of like, no one's doing it on the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. The level of confidence you have in your results yeah. usually depends on how much it is that computational task when you put it with, like yeah. more complicated model or longer simulation time or complicated model. Because you're you're trying to figure out the distance between the particular. I mean, there's every every pair of atoms. Wow. Yeah. I mean, are they using this in pharmaceutical research a lot? Yeah, that's where it's been developed. No, no, no. no. Most of the uh, programs that I use are so much more than academics, but they do use the I would think drug design or something would be like some really uh well small molecules are one of the few compared to proteins and I have more anybody yeah right anybody's a protein check. Okay. Yeah, because a PhD I she has an ex-girlfriend. She was she was modeling like lipids to see cell membranes. What would be, when and why would lipids? When the opening would go? Why? That was a long time ago. Okay, interesting. But then the, the cone jellyfish seems really different, though. It's a, it's a very different kind of approach. Yeah, even methodologically speaking. But you're still doing actual sequencing and old-fashioned sort of running it through. Okay. Huh. Does that, does that mean when you're done someday, you're, 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 there's not a particular that feels that's what you're restricting yourself to? My defense is on March 9th.
<laughs> Someday soon, I guess. <laughs> okay. That's, uh, but then it's good that you've got a bunch of different kinds of things. Okay. Does that mean you're also on the blog market? I am. I, 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 I want to start with something that I'm close to for the pretty stuff. Yeah. yeah. Maybe pretty design and time out. Yeah. Yeah. But later on, I will. I've heard the scientists have been made of the the scientists have been made of the Yeah, probably not even close. Yeah. Go grab some cookies and stuff. Hey, Liz, how are you? Good to see you. What are you up to? Yeah, I'm a painful uh, yeah. dick in now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I hope I like some time to leave. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can't find the bus. Still, I mean, it's better to get an interview than not get an interview. That's yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Free trip in the middle of winter, but whatever. <laughs> I was gonna say next week. Uh, hopefully, it warms up. Yeah. No, but I, I, like, but I remember I had an interview in New Haven around the same time, like in early January. And I had to fly in in a small plane to New Haven, Connecticut, in the middle of a winter storm. Like that could have been the end of, you know, not just my career but my life. It was crazy. Yeah, was, like someone was saying, why didn't you take the train? You know, but I had to in order to get there in time for the interview. Uh, fly in a small plane to a small airport. So hopefully you don't have to do that. Well, yeah, but well, good luck. It's uh, yeah. It's a, it's a very uh, stressful process, the job market, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went like, I did. Yeah, I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do want to go to Boston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, Boston's great because, well, obviously, there's lots of universities there, yeah. and uh, it's a very, you know, lots of things going on. It's not difficult to uh, find people to, to do things with, too. Yeah. So, oh, good. Great. Uh, good luck. Hopefully, it's, uh, uh, you end up getting something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What have you been doing the last while? Then? Um, oh, no. Kind of easy, easy yeah, but, but not the most rewarding kind of uh, activity. I mean, but, yeah. Yeah.
Um, so we'll be going into our second part of the presentations. So if you can just you know, grab your refreshments and take a seat at the table. Great. Okay, so our first speaker um, who will be presenting after our intermission is Tian Chi, and his presentation is called River and Stones. So let's give him a round of applause. Okay, hang on. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tim Chi and uh, thanks to SGC very much to uh, give me this opportunity and I'm very happy to be here tonight to uh, introduce with you with my um, study field and my current ongoing master thesis research. And so uh, a word to summarize uh, my field of study is uh, geomorphology. So it is a discipline that uh, studies different types of landforms and how they evolve themselves uh, by changing the shape while shaping the environment that surrounded us. Uh, specifically, my interest is in fluvial geomorphology, uh, which incorporates a wide range uh, of research topics related to the interaction between river flow and the landforms uh, on the riverside, uh, which, if, if classified by the scale of study can be uh, divided into micro scale and macro scale. So for, mi for micro scale uh, fluvial geomorphological study, um, it's mainly focusing on the physical and uh, dynamical mechanisms of particles in the river, uh, in, the, in the stream. And some typical examples include uh, sediment transport and uh, storage. Uh, and there are also studies focusing uh, on a streamlined physical structure, mobility and stability. And micro scale, um, on the other hand, um, focus on either a special river uh, and how it changes throughout a longer time period. Uh, as you can see here is an example showing on the left. And this is a braided river system, which was uh, ample of sediment flow and is actively changing its river network due to sediment uh, transport and deposition. So it's a very intensively uh, changing environment, with very dynamic. And also micro-scale geomorphology also focuses on topics that coupled with other disciplines, just, uh, such as investigation on the ecological and environmental implications, uh, such as the uh, geohazard, like a uh, flood hazard in forecasting, and also uh, from, from an ecological aspect, uh, there, will, uh, there will be some salmon spawning and the survival rate of salmon egg in, in different um, sediment structure. So my research is limited to micro scale, and uh, I want to find out uh, how do hydraulic and morphologi morphological characteristics control the burial depths um, uh, of sediment particles. Uh, in a plain language, it would be how do flood and riverbed forms uh, affect the vertical distribution of the stones in the river. So I'm going to introduce to you my research uh, uh, in, a, in a perspective, uh, in a morphological perspective, uh, in, a, in a methodological uh, perspective. Uh, so uh, to describe the vertical distribution of uh, particles in the river, uh, I have to use some tracking techniques to track the movement of individual stones in the river. And uh, so, there is, a, there is a sample of 1,500 um, 1, stones that are magnetically tagged and with various grain size that is uh, comparable with the um, grain size distribution of the um, natural, natural stream bed. And then uh, these tracer stones were seeded in the riverbed and were located annually. So I will use the magnetic sensor uh, to locate them. It's more like uh, playing a mine sweeping game. Uh, so once they were found, the depths, location, and specific uh, bed form that they were located within uh, were, uh, will be noted down. And by doing so, uh, a multi-year data set of stone movement can be examined and further uh, statistical analysis can be made. So this is the method of my uh, uh, thesis, and now I'm working on the re uh, result part. And 
Thank you for uh, listening to my sharing. Thank you, Tenchi. Um, do we have any questions for this research topic? Demet. Yeah, I have one. Uh, do you find any like groupings in terms of like this kind of rivers have this kind of distribution of stone movement? Like, is it very like set up or is it very diverse? Yeah, so uh, the next question is, uh, did I find any difference of the vertical distribution across different river system? Uh, so, actually I, I am using two data sets. One is from East Creek, which is uh, east of Vancouver. And the second data set I use is uh, from Auto Pay, which is uh, in Scotland. So these two river systems are very uh, different. So the first one near Vancouver is a pretty stable river system with very uh, narrow stream and pretty low energy uh, river system, so the, so the morphological change uh, is pretty uh, pretty slow. And on the other hand, the Alto Peak, which is in Scotland, is a braided river system, so it's uh, very active. Uh, there is a lot of uh, hill, sl uh, hill slope, uh, the mass movement that injects a lot of sediment into the river, so the, so the sediment regime, the sediment supply, the sediment uh, transport uh, regimes are all very different. So uh, this can change the distribution of uh, both the maximum depth and also the uh, distribution uh, significantly. Uh, so it, the distribution can be varied from a gamma distribution or a exponential distribution. So it's uh, all kinds of um, activities that can be observed in different river systems. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you mentioned like the various grain sizes for the magnetically tagged. Uh, it, it, does mass not matter, like the, the, the weight uh, of the individual, or is grain size matter more? Yeah, I, I actually, the, uh, uh, sorry, so the question is, um, uh, there are, so for the experiment setup, there are different grain size of tracers, and the question is, uh, does the mass matter? Uh, so um, my answer to that is, the grain size is very, is highly uh, correlated to the mass. So the larger the grain size, uh, the, the heavier the, the, the tracer particle would be. So, uh, so the, mag the magnet would, be, would, would have the same uh, density and it is incorporated into the uh, natural stone which, which was uh, actually drilled in, drilled a hole in and the magnet was put in. So that uh, uh, actually the density of the tracer is very similar to the uh, natural stone. So uh, the density and the volume is actually uh, a positive association. So, thank you, thank you so much, Tianjin, for all the questions. Our next presenter is Neela Farr, and her topic is motion planning and physics-based character control. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Neela Farr, and uh, I'm a master's student at the Department of Computer Science. Uh, my group works on motion planning and physics-based character control. Um, so let's think about motion. Motion is a very important part of our lives, and a lot of skills that we do at the core of them are basically a different a set of different motions that we put together. For example, sports, for example, like even as simple as walking, or as complicated as like many different sports. So um, we are trying to simulate this motion for the humanoid because then we can, uh, we can use that in many different uh, applications, for example, gaming, uh, computer animation, different modeling, and to get the motion in a physics simulator, which is um, very natural looking and, uh, uh, and looks good, uh, is actually a complicated task. So um, the approach that I use for my research is called reinforcement learning. The idea is actually very much inspired by how we learn. The way we learn is that, for example, let's take the task of walking. When, the, uh, when we're very little, the way we walk is that we first start moving around and like we stumble and we fall, and that's a very painful experience. So we learn not to repeat those movements. Instead, when we walk successfully, when we take a few successful steps, we are cheered by our parents, so that's a very good experience for us, so we learn to repeat those. And this is what makes us learn over time certain skills and certain uh, motions that makes us achieve certain things. So the idea of reinforcement learning is very similar. The agent or the virtual character 
basically performs different actions and the environment gives it a reward. Now, depending on that action, the reward could be high or low. And the, the agent or the virtual character basically learns to um, repeat the actions that gives it the highest reward. And this is how it learns different skills. Now, reinforcement learning has been applied to character motion uh, in various different ways, um, in various different skills. Uh, but one thing that's missing in the field and is uh, to be worked on is more complex environments and uh, environments which involve a lot of more interactions between the character and the environment. And for that reason, I picked climbing as my um, as a, as an environment to work on uh, for this problem because it has many different components. For example, uh, it involves path planning to, to start from a start position to an end goal. It involves uh, interactions with the environment that involve physics and could get really complex. And another component is that it, um, the motion has to be balanced throughout the entire climb and to look good. So the goal of my research is to um, successfully achieve this task both in my personal life as a hobby and also in simulation for my research. Thank you. <laughs> So the question was, how do I, uh, how do we define that emotion is natural looking, and basically how to define the reward? Is that is that yeah. the So that is one of the most complicated parts about RL. Um, is basically with this formulation, the question, the big question becomes, how do we um, design the reward so to make it perform certain tasks? Because a lot of times it actually ends up doing something unexpected. Um, so a lot of the work actually goes into basically that, like designing the rewards such that it performs what we want it to perform. So what do you want to achieve at the end? Is it like a graphic thing that you see actually, I don't know, uh, some uh, stick note figure or something goes up? Or is it more kind of like the computer tells you that it would take this path and that's the best path? Um, in theory, you can do the second, uh, so Parham is asking if uh, the end result would be anything visual or it would be something like a success or failure result that the computer gives us. Um, it could be both. Um, what we do in my, uh, in my field is definitely very heavily reliant on the visual feedback. Uh, because a big part of it, like especially in applications like gaming or computer animation, what really matters is that the motion looks good. And a lot of times that is really like quant uh, qualitative, it's not really quantitative. So um, even though we do have different measures for quantitatively measuring the success of the system, uh, we also really need to visualize it. So yeah, that's an example of just a character like doing different motions like backflip and all. But eventually, like, I'm going to have something like that for the kind of task. What do you mean by planning a motion? Yes, good question. So uh, the question is, what do you mean by planning a motion? Um, so the idea is that we, we do this so naturally that we don't even think about it. When we are in a certain situation in our environment, we already um, plan like if I want to get from this point to another point, I already have a certain like motion in mind, but that is really not natural for for like a computer, um, a, a virtual character. So that is a big part of how we integrate this, um, how we solve this problem is that component of motion planning, which is like a high level uh, component of it. Which is like, how do we plan the motion and now how do we perform the motion? And her presentation will be about automatic street parking space detection using visual information and convolutional neural networks. Wow, that is great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Tala, a master's student in computer engineering. And as you may have guessed from this little meme that I made, my project is about street parking. So, 
parking, uh, coming from a big city, on street parking in specific is a very big problem. It leads to traffic congestion. Personally, I've spent a lot of time going around blocks, constantly trying to find parking. It wastes time, it wastes fuel, it harms the environment, so we need a solution. Um, the reason I'm emphasizing on on-street because there's a lot of solutions that are already present for parking lots, like sensors and uh, uh, like indoor parking lots is, is not a hard problem to solve. So, um, my project to give you the big picture is I'm using an object detection network with a deep learning model to train it to be able to detect where parking spots are on the street. So typically my end result, I mean this is my result, <laughs> would look something like this, where you get a frame and it identifies this area as the parking spot. Uh, now this is a very challenging problem because uh, as the user or any driver is driving around, we're assuming they have dashboard cameras and they're constantly monitoring the environment we're taking the video stream, we're cutting it down into frames, and the trained model that I have uh, used uses these frames to detect whether a parking spot is available, and once it detects the parking spot, it uses some sort of application that shares this information over 5G and uh, Google Maps to specify the exact location where this parking spot is. It's a challenging problem because as you know, every car is different. We need to know whether this parking space fits that specific car, whether you're allowed to park in this area, because as you can see in Vancouver, there are timings, like from nine to five you can park here. Um, there are bus stops, there are intersections. So um, it might confuse these two as parking spaces. Um, future work that I will be working on, because I'm already done with this object detection is kind of using motion detection to be able to skip frames that are not relevant and to only focus on one processing frame to be able to let the user know that this is not the same parking spot and we've moved on to the next one. Uh, yeah, thank you so much and I'd like to thank my supervisors and St. John's College for supporting me throughout this journey. I'm almost done, so that's great. Why did you choose convolutional neural networks for this problem? Okay, so convolutional neural networks and deep learning is one of tip. Like I specifically used YOLO, which is you, you only look once, not you only look once. Um, <laughs> it's an object detection model, and it makes it much easier to because typically what I did is I took video frames, I split them into pictures, I labeled them. And then I trained the model. So using YOLO in specific is a perfect fit for this role because I wanted to do both detection and classification. So yeah, that's that's thank you for that question. So just a curiosity, but like is there an end goal of like maybe in the future we can expect like I go to my phone and be like, hey Siri, find me parking and then it will tell me where to go? Is that yeah, actually that that is the end goal. I, I'm, uh, I'm working with Telus actually to create an application at the end that users can use uh, to be able to find parking. So you can use voice <laughs> commands for that as well, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, um, So basically, my supervisor drove around Vancouver and took these oh videos. So we, we collected our own data, which was a long process. But also, in the future, uh, the drivers that are driving around, they're constantly taking videos as inputs for other users to know where parking is. So it's constantly being updated every few seconds. And can you also use satellites? Yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, is, that is also a possibility. So typically, in the end, we will be using like Google Maps to specifically set you know the location of the exact parking spot. 
So can your system uh, tell this information where is the next parking available on the spot, like real time? Yeah, exactly. It's real time. That's that's what makes it mm -hmm. very convenient, uh, but also very challenging. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Neha or Sudan, do you have a question? I did. Um, what are the kind of privacy um, questions that you deal with when you work with uh, models like this and tools like this, which will capture data, um, visual data, um, real life? Okay, uh, privacy issues. So we don't really have any privacy issues to be specific with this because we are kind of kind of just monitoring the street, which is 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 not a breach of privacy. So typically, that's not a problem for us. Sean Wynn, and he will be presenting about promotion, framing, and consumer attitude. Hey everyone, my name is Sean Wynn. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in uh, uh, software school business. Um, I'm, my major is in uh, marketing and behavioral science. And uh, thanks for uh, St. John's College support. This is one uh, part of my thesis, and I already finished the manuscript. Um, so I will present some uh, results today. Um, so firstly, please look at the two pictures here. So they are, those are two types of uh, common coupons that you may have already received, let's say from Uber Eats or from uh, 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 DoorDash, right? So the first one is enjoy 50% off, but there is a $5 max discount on my order. Okay. And the second one is enjoy $5 off on an order of $10 or more. Okay, so the two messages are clear, right? So which one would you prefer? You may have an answer in your mind, right? So let's firstly look at the economic analysis. So the, the uh, black dots here is, uh, re refers to the one on the right hand, uh, which is I call threshold promotion because there's a threshold of $10. So if you spend less than ten dollars, you basically have no discount, right? So it's like, yeah. but if you spend more than ten dollars, you have five dollars discount. And for the one on the left, I call it capped promotion. Um, it means when you spend less than ten dollars, you have fifty percent off. But if you spend more than ten dollars, they are the same uh, as the threshold promotion. It's five dollars. So. From the charts, we can see that capital promotion actually dominates threshold promotions. So if the economic incentives is the only concern that consumers have, people should prefer capital promotions to threshold promotions. However, the experiments I have done uh, shows that people prefer threshold promotions to capital promotions, even if it's a joint, uh, like side-by-side -side choices. So consumers know both options, but they still choose the one that it is uh, inferior objectively. And also I conducted um, uh, field experiments which have higher ecological um, uh, validity. Uh, I conducted experiments on TikTok to show two types of promotions and people have higher click-through rates, uh, which indicates that people have higher interest in the uh, threshold promotions to um, capture promotions but capital promotions actually is better, right? Um, so yeah, that's my finding, uh, which would um, um, have some like education uh, for the consumers and also for the marketers that they need to review everything, uh, like the restrictions they have to let consumers know everything. Yeah, thanks. Do you have any question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for the TikTok uh, experiment, what if the user they use autoplay? What uh, you mean autoplay? Autoplay on the app. Oh, this is click through rates. So they the DV is like how many people have clicked the uh, the the ads so that they will go to a website. Hmm. So even it's autoplay, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, uh -huh. it's very silent. Yeah, curious. What what were you giving this count on? Like, what <laughs> you, you said like you, you were giving some promotion on TikTok. 
what were your what product were you giving this? Oh, yeah, good question. This is uh, fruit ordering. So when people click that, they will go to a website which will give them a, a coupon, a real coupon. What, what website? If you have some of those, three dollars. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you are right. Like uh, people might go for threshold coupons, but yeah. I have was I'm wondering that how they came up with this value ten dollar because there is nothing on Uber Eats that you can get for ten dollars. <laughs> you have to have spent more than ten dollars. <laughs> Yeah, so, so uh, the choice of that number also matters to. You mean the threshold yeah. higher yeah. versus yeah. lower? Yes, exactly. So I did not present here, but I do have an experiment showing that if the threshold is too high, people prefer the yeah. cap yeah. 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 Oh, follow up. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay, so Shinko is asking what kind of uh, uh, lesson that consumers can know from my findings. Uh, I would say is that they need to be aware of my findings. So I need to uh, market my findings to let them know when they see those kind of coupons, uh, they cannot only follow their emotions to make decisions, but also to compare different uh, options that they may have. <laughs> how much? How much did it take to for you to increase the threshold to for the feedback to be reversed? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have an answer, but I mean the version I tested is like fifty dollars uh, threshold. Okay. Um, I do test it that people's usual spending on food uh, ordering is around like twenty five dollars. Yep. If you are above that number, I would say people may. Uh, you can have another qu last question. Uh, did you, in, in all the experiments, did you use the same threshold? Uh, I changed it. For example, the TikTok one is like threshold of five, and this one is threshold of ten. So I mostly usually use ten. Sorry, I meant between the two different ways of giving the the discount. Was the threshold the same in both um, yeah, trapped or? Yeah. So you you see. This graph, so the yeah. line here is the same for the two versions always. So the $10 uh, is the kind of like a turning point, it's the same on the two, two versions all, always in every experiment. Thank you. And I hope you learn. Thanks, Shangmin. Um, our next speaker is Nehal. And <laughs> Nehal is here, but we do have a note that says that. He presented a pre-recorded video, right? Okay, awesome, great. So then Javik will help us play that. Okay, so I turn off my thing, right? This presentation assesses whether the Government of Canada's AI risk assessment tool is enough to address their AI adaptation for automated decision making. Without tangible definitions of how AI's benefits outweigh its risks, public trust in the government's use of AI for automated decision making faces clear shortfalls. With AI's black box perception and a widely lacking systems understanding among users, it is difficult to foster machine human interaction. While AI literacy is an obvious solution, others like public and um, Others like um, data quality control, incentivization, and continuous and consistent information updates are all ill-equipped to address unpredictable negative impacts of AI decision making. This uncertainty contributes to fear and resistance from the public and also creates potential for a slowdown in AI transformation. With the disruptive technology label, government efforts to digitize services is on a steep hill to a transformative systems change. To avoid bureaucratic barriers, timely, agile, and incremental improvements would be, would be much easier to implement rather than adapting to a wholly new system. These restraints exists in, exist in terms of redirecting administrative resources for public communications and creating a space for democratic and productive public consultation. 
Another caveat in the development of such AI lies with the learning architecture of the model. And these models are contingent upon training data sets used by data scientists to create algorithms. So what does the government say about this? According to the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat, a history of biased data and lack of explainability associated with AI for automated decision making has made model selection extremely important. In response to calls for transparency further, the government's AI risk assessment tool promotes responsible use and algorithmic accountability. It looks at raw scores for risk and mitigation and accounts for impact levels in four major areas. These are rights, health and well-being, economic interests, and ecosystem sustainability. However, policy solutions for creating a better human experience need to move away from risk mitigation. Rather, a more effective strategy would be to combine it with increased public education and strong preventative measures created with increased user experience research and public consultation. Risk identification is only a part of the puzzle and needs additional human input whose risks can be understood and prepared for by the government and for those who are accessing these government services. There's definitely opportunity for the government to do better and dedicate further research and development towards responsible AI uh, and its uses by the government. And this can be achieved by filling up knowledge gaps and um, through public education and also use more focused user experience research, which borrows from public consultation um, insights and findings. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for entertaining this very unconventional participation. <laughs> uh, Lewis. Yeah. Uh, thank you. What sorts of programs does government use AI for, just broadly speaking? Right, so broadly it uses AI for all sorts of um, service provision, um, which requires a large centralized system. Hmm. Um, one of them being um, child care benefits or any sort of government benefits. Um, and uh, especially immigration, like uh, the bigger kind of systems, taxes as well. So a lot of social services and economic services that the government provides are automated. And um, in recent years with the government's uh, digital transformation strategy as well, there's a huge shift between federal and provincial governments um, trying to get more and more services um, transformed into digital tools. So like that audit on taxes kind of thing, like is our tax returns being looked at and then uh, is it AI that's determining who to audit? Is that an example when you say taxes? Um, so Professor, you asked about uh, the use of AI and automated decision making for tax auditing. Yeah. If I'm, yeah. So I would say that uh, there might be something, but I would like to refrain from answering this because it's beside, beyond the scope of my research. I, I have focused a little bit more on how this um, automated decision making can be improved on, but haven't delved into the specific uses and um, case by case uh, um, implementation in every sector. There was also a question in the back. So the question is about responsible AI and any global examples that I may have come across. Um, considering that this is a very specific niche topic about automated decision making, especially used by large entity organizations like the government, I would say that the government has been a few steps behind in general um, from private sector use and utilization of AI. So. I personally haven't come across any such examples, but I'll be happy to look into it and maybe have a conversation with you outside of this presentation session. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Mahal. Um, next, our presenter is Aditya, and his presentation 
written in all caps is how is language understood? <laughs> how is language understood? <laughs> Okay, uh, hi everyone. So, as many of you might know, I'm a linguist, which, mean, which means I do all sorts of odd things in terms of listening to how people talk and why they do so. So, uh, as a linguist, uh, my research mainly, mainly focus, focuses on two aspects. One is called morphosyntax, which basically is how structure is built in a language. Hmm. So uh, even though we see, like we uh, humans have the ability to speak language, we don't really realize that language is structurally way more complex than it seems to us. For example, we have a simple sentence like, uh, I saw a man with binoculars, which is very easy to understand for a English speaker, but it has actually such a complex structure. Or uh, let's take this infamous example, anti-establishmentarianism. A small single word in English has this kind of uh, sort of hierarchical structure built into it. So this is morphosyntax. This is the, the building of words and structures is what I do. And the second thing that I do in combination with this is how language is processed in real time as someone is reading it or someone is speaking it or someone is listening to it. So what I do is basically at the intersection of these two things. So as I was saying, language is basically, everything in language is hierarchically structured. As you can see, everything is like uh, one about the other and stuff like that. But the input that you receive as a speaker or the output that you produce is linear. You don't, uh, so even though the word starts here, like the root of anti-establishment is established, you don't hear established first and hear everything later. You start from here and you hear this as a linear string even though the word is computed in many different ways. So uh, then, so this actually sort of produces different kinds of challenges in terms of how people understand and comprehend language because something that is inherently hierarchical but is produced and heard linearly. So uh, that is sort of more of a large scale picture of what I do. More specifically, what I do is deals with case systems. So you might know case as in nominative case, accusative case, data case, generative case, etc. So let's take a look at this example. And before we do, uh, remember that words that appear in the same position in a sentence have same properties. So with that caveat, we can take a sentence like she likes her. Pretty simple sentence, right? The pronoun she here is subject, which occurs in nominative case and the pronoun her, which is the accusative form of the same pronoun. Yeah. So objects are always in accusative case, subjects are always in nominative case. Now, if you, if you replace these with proper nouns, Susan likes Mary, we see that Susan and Mary both appear in their normal form. You don't actually see the word Mary changing to accommodate the accusative case. But since it is in the object frame, we know for sure that Mary as an accusative case on it. In this case, it, it tells us that in English, accusative case is actually realized by nothing. It's there, it's structurally there, and we see it on pronouns, but we don't see it on nouns. So it's something that's there, but is invisible. And structurally, you can see its effects. It's somewhat like gravity. You know it's there, you feel it, you can't see it. So my, the question that I'm answering is, are such visible and invisible parts of uh, parts of language or properties of language, how are they processed? Are invisible properties of language processed the same way as visible properties are or not? Well, talk to me in six, uh, in six to eight months and I'll, I'll be able to answer that. Thank you. <laughs> So that is, I'll be in the middle of it. Sorry. Can you repeat it? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, uh, you were asking that what approach I'm taking because understanding language could be approached from psychological, neurological, and a number of other perspectives. So, uh, the simplest answer is I'll be taking everything, like a bit of everything. So, for example, the way I approach this is uh, I, can, I can do 
so the the plan the thing I plan to do is basically a more psychology linguistics intersection intersection. That's why that's why it's called psycholinguistics. What I do is I basically uh, there is a thing called eye tracking where uh, as people read something or or as I, as people are watching something, their eye their eye movement is tracked. And basically, an experiment is structured in such a way that their eye motion motion is going to reveal what properties of language are like how are they processed. Like what structures are more difficult and what structures are less difficult to parse. So that thing I'll be uh, taking into account. Another thing people do is ERP, like event related brain potential. Is basically that's basically when like there is retinal voltages throwing. Uh, whenever you see a stimuli, there is voltages flying out in your brain, and you basically measure that. So that could also be one of one of the things. I think Parham has had. Yeah. Oh no, actually I don't work on English at all. This is very boring, I tell you. I, I work on Marathi, which is my first language and has like about 90 million speakers. Don't want to brag. So, but yeah. So from English I know it's very structured. Like it has a lot it's, of grammar rules. What about Marathi when you do it? It's way more complex. If I have to explain this data point, what I do, it takes 15 minutes to explain just one data point. That's why I resorted to English. So different languages, so one language can have a lot more like this gravity of like missing things. Uh, I mean, yes, but if that, if by that you mean one language can be more complex than the other, no. But yes, some languages will have will show this property in a much more uh, it'll be on steroids, basically. Yeah. So Marathi case system is English on steroids. And the, sorry, the reason why you are studying Marathi is because it's your native language, or is it because it has this property. It has this property. It, it actually allows us to actually answer this question because you can't answer that in English. Because what happens in English is this property actually doesn't really interact with anything else in the language. Like it happens, it's there, but it's doing nothing. But in Marathi, you can see it interact with different other properties of grammar. That's why it allows us to test th these things. And uh, English doesn't. Yes. Do you test it on native speakers or people yes. learning it? Uh, I'll start out with native speakers. Uh, the, uh, yeah, basically everything will be done on native speakers unless I have a very, spe very specific reason to test it on learners in terms of whether they also acquire these kinds of things. Yeah, but I'll start out with. Question, yeah, yeah, I'll start out with uh, native yeah. speakers too. Yes, Ashish. So you focus on how these the. So you focus on the processing of these properties? Yes, or processing of language in general, yes. Uh, yeah, processing of language in general. But I wonder how these properties or structures are actually made in a language. Because it must have some, it might have some kind of interrelation with how they are processed also. Uh, what do you mean by need? Like, for example, when I was born, the language was there. So I learned no. it some way. No, but the language wasn't there. Your capacity to learn the language was there. You learn the language by exposure. So by if, if you were born, if you were born and you were exposed to, let's say, uh, Cantonese, then you would have started speaking Cantonese and not Hindi. No, no, no. What I'm saying, English was there. People were speaking English when I was born. People were speaking Hindi. I picked it up and I learned and I I did something in my brain. I'm sure. But what if I want to generate a new language right now? So I need to come up with all these structures, right? Yes. So yes. how these structures are created? Because if I create a structure, I know how to process it. Or if I know how to process it, I can create a structure, no. isn't it? You'll only know how to create one. You won't know how to process one. It, that, that's because it, it's unconscious. You don't oh, know what you're doing. That's why you, you have to uh, carefully construct experiments to test those things. Okay. Yeah. You, you could try and like invent a language. People do. Yeah. But yeah, you won't know how, how it, it's processed. If the case sounding, so you talked about the case sounding process in the language you study as very complicated, and I imagine that means that there's much more that's visible, right? If, if there's a case sounding on a direct object, you know it's a direct object. So then what is invisible in the language you're talking about? What is less clear? Uh, there are some markings on the subject which are invisible. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, but then that's also a funny thing in the sense on certain subjects they could be visible, on certain subjects they could be invisible. Oh, okay. 
So yeah, there's a whole lot of various things, optionality and stuff. So depending there. on the type of noun, you have certain things that are visible and certain things that then will not be yes. visible. In, in, a, in a simplistic way, yes. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker topic is determining residual stress by indentation and surface imaging. And the speaker is Sadat. So. Hello, uh, I am Sadat, and I'm a master's student in mechanical engineering. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, here is my research. So, uh, okay. So, uh, everyone's familiar with uh, rubber bands, right? You all played with rubber bands. So, what happens when you stretch a rubber band? You feel a little force that wants to get it back to its original form, right? Uh, that little force is caused by internal stresses inside that rubber band and those stresses don't want to exist, so they want to relieve themselves by getting that rubber band back to its original form, and then they're gone. Now what happens if you keep on stretching and stretching and stretching this rubber band? At some point, it just reaches a limit where it has to snap, right? It snaps because it's reached a stress limit beyond which the material cannot keep its bonds together, so it just breaks apart. Same theory is valid in metals. So you see this huge chunk of metal here? This thing has been hammered into shape and because of all the hammering, it's accumulated a lot of stress inside. And that stress has reached a point where it cannot be inside the material anymore. So bonds start breaking on the inside, a crack starts to form, that crack propagates right to the outside and this whole chunk of metal is now cracked and is useless. So, all construction equipment, bridges, flyovers, everything uses metals, right? We don't want any of those to crack open while in use. So, it would be a great idea if we had a way to measure how much stress there is in these materials, right? So, that is what I'm working on. I'm working on a non-destructive method to measure stress in live objects. So, the way it works is this. I'm trying to create a little poke on the material. The poke diameter is like, I don't know, uh, thickness of your nail, so it's super small. And I'm taking images of around that poke, like before and after making that poke. So what happens here is this. So do you see the simulation here on the bottom right? This little line is poking into the specimen here. And the material around the specimen is flowing outward because it has to go somewhere, right? The outward flow and the amount of flow is somehow a function of the stress inside the material. Now the question is, what function, what is the quantitative numerical relationship of that displacement with the residual stress inside the material? And uh, that relationship is what I'm trying to determine through my research. So it's going to involve uh, a lot of simulation work. And finally, if I'm able to get, or when I'm able to get that relationship, I need to test it out on many calibrated material specimens just to prove that it works like across a spectrum of materials. So yeah, that's uh, my research. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Yeah, Brown. Uh, what classes of materials have you tested? Like, metal would be very different from wood. That's perfectly right. So Ronald's question is, what class of materials am I working on? Because uh, absolutely, so each di these different materials have different properties. So metals have isotropic properties, which means in any direction in the metal, the property is going to remain constant. While say wood is orthotropic, which means in three per mutually perpendicular directions, properties could change. So, yeah, it does matter, and my research is more in isotropic, so generalized materials, yes, which are mostly metals. Yeah. Ah, yes, Ashish. Can you extrapolate your findings on one isotropic material to another, or you need to test separately? No, that is the idea. So, um, so Ashish's question is, can I extrapolate my findings on one material or one metal to another metal? That is the idea. So, the theory I generate should be like across all isotropic materials. It should work. So I'm trying to make it property agnostic so that it just measures residual stress and does not, you know, accommodate 
effects from other properties of the material. Yeah, Param. You said uh, this is the non-destructive way to do it. What is the destructive way? <laughs> yeah, so Param's question... Yeah, so Baran's question is, what are the current techniques of testing this? So currently, they drill a hole into the material and then uh, look at how the, um, the material around the hole reacts and deforms. Because imagine this, if, uh, so there is a stressed brick of material and you suddenly create a hole in between, which means there is no material in there. So suddenly there is a relief point and the material around it reacts because it wants to relieve itself of stress as well. So the way it relieves itself there is an indication of how much stress there was before drilling the hole. This one, instead of making a hole, you make an indent. Exactly. And how small is the indentation and how much do you have to see? Like, how, what's the area that you see? Right. The area uh, that this camera is seeing is 5 millimeters by 5 millimeters. So it's like barely this much. Yeah. So the extrapolated idea here is if you have large structures like bridges and flyovers, you can use this device at like multiple points across the whole structure and you can create a map of how much stress there is at each point. That will give you an idea of like how the whole structure is kind of stressed. So a, lot of the stru uh, a lot of the pressure or stress is localized, it's not like... Uh, That's true. Homo homogenous everywhere, right? Correct. So through simulation you can also know which points are critical and you can also focus this method on those points that will help. Yes, Tal. Since we're talking about stress, how do we deal with human stress? Yeah, great question. <laughs> how do we deal with human stress? <laughs> we drill a hole. Yeah. Drill a hole. I should probably do a PhD Test the destruction. That. Test the destruction is the way. Yeah. How do we isolate <laughs> Supervisor's technique is tested. Well, if you're available as a test subject, I'd love to try it on you. Okay, let's go. As long as it's not destructive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be a little destructive on you. Know. Anybody else? Am I good? All right. Thank you so much. She'll be joining us from online via Zoom. She's an SJC alumni. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be back virtually with the SJC community, a community that has my sincere gratitude for supporting me financially and relationally while I was finishing my MA thesis in 2021. Uh, my name is Brienne Lin, and I am currently a second year PhD student in the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations at the University of Toronto. My discipline is that of ancient Near Eastern archaeology, and I specifically study the archaeology of ancient Southwest Asia prior to about 500 BCE. My MA thesis, which I completed as part of UBC's Department of Ancient Mediterranean and Near Eastern Studies, analyzed a group of ancient stamp seals pictured in the top right hand corner of my slide from Bahrain, which is a small island immediately northwest of Qatar in the Gulf between Iran and the Arabian Peninsula. 4,000 years ago, in ancient Bahrain, then called Dilmun, merchants and other individuals engaging in economic transactions own small stamp seals like these, each like these. Each of these seals bore unique engravings, often depicting humans, animals, plants, and astral signs. The impressions made in clay by these seals effectively served as signatures and were useful for identifying and differentiating the property of different owners. During the 1960s, 15 stamp seals and two cylinder seals were discovered at a mass burial site in northern Bahrain. They quickly disappeared from the public eye into private collections, but about 50 years later, two of these stamp seals, along with impressions of nine other stamp seals known from the site, all depicted here, were donated as part of the Blackmore Collection to the Laboratory of Archaeology at UBC. The goal of my MA thesis was to conduct an analysis of the donated seals and seal impressions, including publishing new data about the two rediscovered stamp seals and exploring any fresh insight these seals and the other impressions could offer to our understanding of this category of objects and the society that produced them. The seals and impressions in the Blackmore collection are highly representative of the type of seals common in Bahrain Island between about 2050 and 1950 BCE the period immediately before Dilmun rose as a powerful state that came to occupy a very influential position among the trading entities of the Gulf. 
The seals not only reflect the historical context and highly interactive nature of Dillman in this period, but also a key period of transition between the earlier and later versions of stamp seals in the Gulf region. Through my analysis, I was able to propose a relative chronology for the seals in the Blackmore collection and offer fresh insights into the relationship between the evolution of these seals and the region's historical development. The evolution of these seals is also informative for our study of how the identities of the seal owners may have evolved over time. Thank you. I can't, I hope no one's speaking because I can't hear anybody right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I still can't hear you. Henry, you need to unmute. Sorry. And yeah. then she, Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, okay great. Um, do we have uh, do we have evidence of these same iconographic images on seals in either Mesopotamia or the in this river valley around this time? So what's fascinating is we no, have now, now I have to okay now I have to <laughs> Okay, you can hear me now? Okay. Um What's interesting or what's fascinating about these seals is that we, we do have evidence for both um, imagery from both regions. Um, earlier versions of the seals uh, carry more um, Indus influence um, because originally these types of seals uh, originate in the Indus Valley and move west and are adopted by Dillman and made their own. Um, so earlier versions of the Dillman seals have more Indus oriented imagery versus later versions of the seals when Mesopotamia starts to exert more power and influence over Dillman, we start to see greater um, influence from Mesopotamia in the imagery of the seals. But Dillman also expresses um, its own unique imagery. So they're bringing in images from both Mesopotamia and the Indus Valley and other regions, but also incorporating their own um, images as well. Quick question for me. Um, so, Brianne, um, so like I've studied media studies before, and in media studies, we learned that the medium is the message. So, the medium itself is um, trying to convey something as well. So, I was wondering, like, you were mentioning about, you know, stamps, um, seals from this ancient time. Like, what is the significance? Like, did you, in your research and findings, did you find something interesting about um, this medium as well, like seals and what that conveys about that certain time, or even has that even transcended to the present time? Like, is there any kind of direct link that even though it's kind of an artifact, but are there like present connections as well? For sure. Um, what I think is fascinating about these seals is that they not only demonstrate changing um, levels of interaction with different regions, um, but also um, they offer us access to understanding individual identities. Um, so a seal essentially um, functioned as a signature and the owner of the seal would have theoretically um, had control to a certain extent over what images appear on the seals themselves. So they're asking questions about how they represent or they're answering questions about how they conceive of their identities or how they want to represent themselves on these um, administrative and economic objects. Um, does that mostly answer your question? I can't hear you, but I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Miko, um, and Miko will be sharing a, his uh, presentation called "We Have More in Common with Saint Helena's Daisy Trees Than You Might Think." So, our resident botanist. <laughs> <clears throat> so, hello everybody. My name is Niko Parachanen, and I'm doing a PhD in botany. 
But first of all, I would like to talk about myself and my own species. So, <laughs> I belong to the species Homo sapiens, uh, the modern human, as, as all of us, us do. And uh, uh, more specifically, I belong to the Finnish population of Homo sapiens, <laughs> which is mostly European, but it has about 5% of Asian ancestry in the, in the genomics of, of Finnish people. And, uh, uh, and I'm actually uh, the product of uh, ancient hybridization of three different species of humans. So when, when my species, Homo sapiens, left Africa and, and came to Europe, it, it met some near death uh, humans in Europe. And, uh, well, they had sex, obviously. <laughs> and uh, this caused hybridization. And then there has been lots of like back crossing. The hybrids have crossed back with, uh, with, with us humans. And also, uh, when, when the populations went uh, further east, they met another species called the Denisovan people. So, uh, so when, the, when the Siberians came to Finland, they, they brought the Denisovan ancestry to Finland. So, so in my genome, I would have about less than 4% of uh, Neanderthal ancestry and less than 0.1% uh, of uh, Denisovan ancestry. But I'm a botanist. I study plants. <laughs> but I, I do study uh, hybridization in plants, and uh, so that's the connection. <laughs> uh, my study system is Saint Helena Island in South Atlantic Ocean. It's an extremely isolated island and uh, very very small. Uh, I study uh, daisy trees. So here you can see two species: the Saint Helena scrubwood and Saint Helena gumwood. Uh, here you can see a little fly uh, pollinating, bringing pollen from scrubwood flower to gumwood flower, and then the gumwood producing the, the seeds, and then the seed producing the, the hybrid, the Saint Helena crown wood. Uh, so that's that's the hybrid. There's been lots of uh, back crossing happening between uh, the hybrids and the scrubwood, especially. And uh, I'm, I'm basically studying uh, the conservation implications of, of hybridization. So is it, the, is it a bad thing? Like uh, historically uh, in conservation, hybridization has been seen as a very bad thing. Mm. But it also it, it broadens the gene pool for the species. So by hybridization, back crossing and a process called intercression, uh, one species gets, gets access to the gene pool of the other species, which has actually happened in humans. For instance, in, in Tibetans, it's believed that the, the capac, uh, ability to, to, uh, to survive in the high altitudes mm -hmm. has actually come from the Denisovan ancestry. Oh, wow. so, so, in a way, it's possible that these this species in, in changing world, they could, they could use the hybridization as as uh, broadening the, the gene pool and to get more variation to the to the population and so survive better in, in the changing world. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, these species are, so the question was that uh, how long has the hybrid zone been on the island and is it stable basically? Okay, so, so these species are extremely rare. Uh, St. Helena gumwood is uh, critically endangered and St. Helena scrubwood is, is vulnerable. They don't actually have a hybrid zone because there are so few populations left. So I wouldn't say that there is a, a stable hybrid zone uh, at the moment. Uh, um, in the work that I've done, I've seen lots of uh, signs of gumwood uh, genome in the in the scrub woods. So I think there is lots of signs for uh, like ancient hybridization that's happened. But I wouldn't say that there's uh, there's a stable.
time scale that okay it's about this amount of time it takes to for a successful process of hybridization? So hybridization itself it doesn't take long. Like it happens in, in it's months. It's kind of evolutionary thinking, uh, like for a species that come out of the hybridization. Is that the thing that happens? Or it is possible to get a new species out of hybridization. Um, on islands, uh, speciation can happen more rapidly than in, mm. in continental systems. Mm. So I think in Hawaii, uh, it's like tens of thousands of years. So essentially, it could be something like that also. Mm. But uh, all these species are very closely related, and this is this is the reason that they can they can still hybridize mm. with each other. But like tens tens of tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, mm. rather than millions. Of what are the main factors that are causing like population loss and vulnerability in the species that you're looking at? Uh, okay, so when the island was found, uh, the Portuguese, they brought goats to the island and they mm. basically ate everything. Mm. Oh, okay. so, yeah. <laughs> and then had the, was that replaced by like western lawns or like were there other things that were put in? Uh, eventually companies? people brought other species uh, right. from the continents to the island so that yeah. they would have firewood and for grazing. Right, so, right. So yes. that also. Okay. Yeah. So basically all the pantropical weeds have been brought to, mm. brought to St. Helena and that's one of the problems that the endemic species are facing at the moment. The, um, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. What determines if two species, I don't know if this is known, but what determines if two species can hybridize or not? Like, like a lion can, for example, hy hy like hybridize with a I don't know, down the line or something, right? Like, how close do they have to be? Where's the limit? <laughs> they, they have to be relatively close. So, lion and tiger can hybridize, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. but to my understanding, the, the hybrid is not fertile. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have to be relatively close. So, I don't think humans at the moment, I don't think we have close enough relatives that we could hybridize with another species. Mm -hmm. uh, both, uh, all of our uh, close relatives have. They died. Thank you. Time really flies because we are our final speaker. No pressure to, um, yeah, Ashley to be here. Ashish Chopra and I was in a master's program from 2018 to 2021 when I did this research and thank you St. John's College for providing this uh, opportunity and the generous scholarship. Now, and uh, a disclaimer, so I was traveling before coming here so I'm still in jet lag so if I sleep in my own presentation so please pardon me. <laughs> um, okay, so the title of my thesis was Alex This Fixes 9, Analysis of Referencing Patterns in Pull Request Discussions. So in software industries, when we build software, it's a very team-based activity. When somebody writes a piece of code, it goes through a review process that we call code review. And in code review, what is exactly happening? It is just a text-based chat discussion around the code by the other team members. And why they are doing that? They're trying to assess the quality of the code submission, whether they want to accept this code or want to reject it. So when we look at these text messages, what is happening, what is all there in those text messages, people are sharing lots and lots of information. They are tagging other users, they are bringing some references from the code, talking about the variables, functions in the code, or they are sharing URL links of external resources like some websites or forums and all that stuff. Now in the research community, what kind of information people are sharing in code review is missing. So we don't know exactly what kind of all kind of information people are talking about in code reviews. Now if we don't know about what people are talking about, then we cannot build better interfaces for them, better tools for them to conduct these kind of conversations. And if we can't build those better interfaces, that means the code review cannot be improved. It cannot be made more productive, which is a big loss to the business in the industry. So that is what my part was in this research contribution, that I try to fill that gap in the research community. So I pose some fundamental questions that what kind of things people are talking about in code review discussions and how do they do that? And how 
how well these information sharing practices are actually supported on the current existing interfaces of chat. For example, GitHub's pull request discussion interface where a code review happens. So in order to do that, I conducted a mixed method study. I first sampled 450 pull request discussions, which contained little over 2000 text messages, which I manually read and analyzed. And I found 7000 references in it, references of different informations that I was talking about. And then I analyzed this data set of 7000 references to identify various patterns of referencing and different behaviors. So what did I get out of this research? What was the outcome? Well, I found that there are 26 different information types which are expressed through 9 different ways in these text messages. So I organize these information types and expression types into different taxonomies which are 6 level deep and this is the body of knowledge that I contributed to the research community. Now this is available for further research and for the industry to pick up and build new products out of it for code reviews. And I also found many, many interesting uh, insights, which I also don't remember anymore. It's been like two years ago. <laughs> so, but the one that I remember very fondly is that source code is the most prominent thing that people are talking about. And this has to be, because it's a code review discussion, right? However, the current existing interfaces, they lack the support of referencing source code. So what people end up doing, they are just referencing source code like a plain text. So they have to write everything in plain text because the tool doesn't support referencing the source code there, which is an irony, which is also a pity. So based on these insights and findings, what I did, I proposed some design implications for building new code review interfaces that can improve the code review activity in future. I didn't build anything. My contribution was totally theoretical. So I built these taxonomies. And then I presented this paper in CSCW, which is the top tier conference in computer science, human computer interaction domain. It received impact recognition award, which means this particular body of research has a bigger impact in the business community as well as in the research community, because it opened grounds for further research in different directions. And I was happy to receive that. It was a surprise, actually. We didn't get it. Like, we didn't apply for it or anything. And so this is my research in short. If you are interested to know more about it, I have written an article in a very layman language on my website. So you can check out my website or you can scan the QR code to get the direct. Thank you. How did you get your sample size? Like what website did you pull from and how did you make it somewhat randomized? Yeah, very good question. So we were thinking of pulling data from like companies like Microsoft, Google, because the code review is happening there when uh -huh. they're building software. But what they're talking about, what they're writing as a piece of code is very proprietary to them. Oh, okay. So what we did, we pulled in these discussions, these chat messages from an open source mm. code platform called GitHub. And on GitHub, when you submit a code, they call that process as pull request. So you need to send a pull request where that discussion happens, where people start talking about that code before accepting the code. Mm. So that's why my title is like pull request discussions. Mm. So I sample this from GitHub. Now GitHub has 100 million code repositories. So from there I had prepared like a very elaborated data pipeline, mm. which took me around 9 to 10 months oh, wow. to just prepare the data pipeline, mm. just code that pipeline to sample all that. And mm. from there, at the end, we came up with 450 PRs. Mm. That so, the so the code creates like the randomization, yeah. it pulls random. Yes, yes. So okay. I, I added random sampling techniques, mm -hmm. I added uh, topic modeling. There's a lot of things that we had to add in the data sampling mm -hmm. so that our samples are diversified across different mm -hmm. kinds of source code mm -hmm. projects like a uh, mobile app development code project or a command line project, server project, AI project. So, because the chat varies from different projects, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Because we can understand just through the summary. So these are two different kinds of expressions. And for example, this variable, it is referenced here in this message. This is referenced through its identity. The variable is known by its name. So that's why they, as is used the name. 
they didn't summarize it or give it a nickname or something, right? So these are different expressions of putting the references in the messages. Thank you. All right. Well, wow, that brings us to the end of the one slice of St. John's talk. We just give another yeah, round of applause to all the students today. Thank you so much for sharing all of your research, whether it's going back in time to history, into the future with AI, or present time now with rivers and education and stones. I think we can all see that as grad students, we all have something that we're really passionate about and that we get to pursue here at UBC at St. John's, um, St. John's College. And so this was such a great celebration of our learning. Yeah. Thanks to Catherine and Demet and uh, Shinke. And uh, on the other end is Jenny and for the organizing of all this. And again, thanks to all of you for sharing. Um, Scholarship applications are coming up again for SJC scholarships. So for those of you who um, uh, were here but haven't, uh, you know, given presentations and because you haven't got a scholarship yet, please apply. Uh, there are different ones again. Uh, during the pandemic, we kind of, for obvious reasons, didn't give out travel scholarships because uh, no one was moving around. Um, but those were for traveling to do research to attend conferences, to present your work and things like that. So that's again there. Uh, the main criteria is, is your citizenship in, within the community. And uh, so uh, again, I uh, encourage everyone to apply. Um, and again, it's, it's money that we all could use in, in uh, this time uh, in terms of inflation things. So, um, but again, thank you to all of you who shared. I, there was a lot because it's a couple of years worth of, of scholarship recipients, but it, it was great to hear. I actually, this is when I'm so happy to just hear all your work because uh, I didn't know last time was your application. And for some people, they said it bears no relationship to your application, what you said you were going to do when you came into UBC. Um, so it's great to actually hear the work that you've ended up doing, especially those of you who are about to defend or finish. So. Thank you, and uh, yeah, thank you again. We'll we'll try to do this every year. But uh, yeah. thanks, Devin. Thanks. Thank so and also thanks. for the resident upcoming. Devin, you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, the resident fellows. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. can talk. To so yeah, um, so we want to kind of keep this going. I think for this uh, coming term, the rest of the term. So I've already heard from Lewis, yeah. who wants to do one RFS as well. But if anybody is interested, so we can do. It could be anyway. Like we could do. Again, a three minutes thesis thing. If you want to do one talk yourself for like 40 minutes, we can do that. And it doesn't have to be your own research either. Like in the past, we've had people talk about how to make tea or their culture. If you want to just, you know, have practice on how to, you know, give a talk or anything, or if you want to just talk more about your research, that would be great too. So you can email me if you're interested in giving a talk, and I think we'll start organizing soon, starting with Lewis, because you mailed me first. So we'll hear more about that research and then. We'll yeah, and many. It also could be like a teaching experience yeah, yeah. or like a workshop or, yeah. Many, and many, many of you used humor in your presentations very effectively. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, there was a PhD in econ economist who examined the voucher system and the economics of it with, with a little tongue in cheek. Um, <laughs> like, so yeah, be very uh, bold and creative if you want. Um, yeah, it's, it can be entertaining as well. So. Uh, and again, a lot of you are using your intelligence in very particular ways in particular fields. But if you want to like go dabble in someone else's field, that's the other thing, you know, from your questions, you're, you're able to understand other people's fields very well too. Um, so yeah, people have given talks in the, the field they wish they had gone into, but they have a stake of it. <laughs> so that's another thing that's happened in the past. Um, so yeah, we encourage you again to, this is for fun in front of your, uh, but if you do want to practice, again, as I said, practice, 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 because the better you get at this, the more really successful you are communicating your ideas to others. Yeah, and I also want to say, by the way, there were so many beautiful presentations yeah. today. And the actual treatment thesis competition for UBC is coming up too. So yeah. some people will have it in their departments, so you can join through that. But there's also the open competition. So if you have any questions about how to join 
or there's like a lot of like because last year we were working with yeah. people organizing it so i still am in contact with them to like help you with and if there's enough of you interested we can do yeah. one here like we we That's for several years in a row we had a saint john's actually competition in the winter and one of one of our saint john's residents zoe lamb went on to win the university competition the canadian one and went to the world's three minute competition so she was a linguist um, and so, and then the year before that, we also had a runner up for the university level. So, and from just from the quality of your, three, you know, from these three minute presentations, I think actually there's several, many of you actually would do very well in that kind of competition. Just because again, you're able, ability to mix clarity, humor, using the visuals, that's really the ones that do very well um, in the three minute thesis competition so yeah encourage you to either uh, but if there's enough here we can actually organize one that's a st john specific because any unit and we're an academic unit can can actually have their own three minute uh thesis competition that then funnels into the university level yeah great okay thanks eat so cookies much. yeah don't leave the cookies don't leave the cookies yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay thanks again for the zoom